The Cloud Foundry Foundation is our sponsor here for our podcast from the Cloud Foundry Summit in Santa Clara, California. Our discussion, the path emerging as organizations move beyond the confusion of disruption and take the journey to transformation. We'll explore the new concepts of multi-cloud and how it relates to open source app development and management at scale. Cloud Foundry gives companies the speed, simplicity, and control they need to develop and deploy applications faster and easier. Learn more about Cloud Foundry at cloudfoundry.org. Uh, so I'm Connor McDonald here uh, doing the New Stack podcast from the Cloud Foundry Summit in Santa Clara. And uh, I'm joined by Angel Diaz from IBM. Uh, welcome to the show, Angel. Thank you. Great to be here. Thanks. So uh, start out, uh, you know, you've been in the ecosystem for a while. Tell me a little bit about what IBM is doing. Sure, sure. You know, uh, you know at, at, at high level, what we're trying to do is help our clients do more for their clients. So that boils down to building better applications, building better business processes. You know, we're kind of in a second generation technology renaissance that's driving you know, business process change. Uh, cloud, cognitive, mobile data analytics, all those things, right, are very important parts of this. Specifically in cloud, right, because this is where we're at the conference here, you know, uh, we are unleashing uh, a developer's ability to create amazing code, but also maintain, change, run, deploy across geographies, across platforms, across topologies. Uh, that's what inherently what we do at the IBM Cloud. You know, I spend my day, I'm, I'm Vice President of Architecture and Technology, so I spend half my day, or maybe a little more half, working internally, but also uh, a lot externally with clients who are trying to kind of push on the art of the possible. So that's kind of at a very high level what we do. Uh, when you look at the, uh, the IBM uh, Cloud, uh, we've got data centers in 40 plus countries across the world. Uh, so you could, you know, th think of that as your typical compute storage network type stuff. Uh, we also have the ability to get at bare metal as well, which is very important uh, for some clients. See, if you want to have a certain level of throughput or you want to use our dark fiber to, to, to have certain network char characteristics, you can do that. Uh, we also uh, provide uh, a platform uh, layer. Uh, which brings in, obviously, Cloud Foundry, what we're doing around containers, uh, something called OpenWhisk, which is our event-driven architectures. And then we have, you know, all of the runtimes and APIs and things that we add on top of that, right? Whether it's Node, Java, Swift, all of the APIs that, that we can bring in through you know, our partnerships with Twitter, what we have with the Weather Channel for IoT data, et cetera. And then, of course, we go even a step further up the massive hierarchy of developer needs. To, to stuff uh, like cognitive, you know, providing sentiment analysis, uh, tone analysis, all those kinds of things. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's fundamentally about speed and about choice with consistency. You know, part of the reason that, that we're here at the conference, part of the reason that we're so obsessed with um, uh, open source is that, you know, we've built our cloud on open technologies. You know, we've helped create these, these centers of gravity like OpenStack, like the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, like the Open Container Initiative, like Cloud Foundry, like Node, et cetera, to give our clients uh, and give developers the ability to uh, build their cloud in such a way that they have interoperability where it matters, uh, but that they also can have that, that, uh, that capability running where it matters to them, whether it's in-house next to the transaction system on-premise or public cloud, uh, and of course the integration between those. Because at the end of the day, there will be no single cloud. There'll be multiple clouds. In fact, I think the theme for this conference is multi-cloud, right? And, and that's very much true. So when you say multi-cloud, uh, you know, and in, in you sort of see the developer patterns that your customers are using, um, you know, uh, what are they doing? How are they implementing this? If we talk about, you mentioned Kaiser earlier as kind of the right. company you spotlighted in your keynote yesterday. What is Kaiser doing? How do they see you know, Cloud Foundry is part of their, their enterprise mix. Uh, this morning we had conversations with a couple of people where we, we talked about how would you maintain sort of new applications and old, would enterprises do that? Yeah, you know, that, that's, that, you know, you've hit on two really, really good questions that a lot of clients ask. One is the, the second one was the workload question, which I'll get into second. And then the first one is obviously what, what our good friends at Kaiser do. We had uh, Sam, who's the uh, director of services, uh, of cloud services for Kaiser. Uh, present with me at the keynote, and he kind of laid out a story. Uh, you know, if you look at the business they're in, it's uh, it is a highly it is a business that is transforming very quickly. Let's put it that way. A lot of changes, a lot of focus on the individual, right? A lot of focus on groups of practitioners. 
um, which also means that the business processes uh, in that industry has changed dramatically as well. Uh, and they will continue to change as more and more partners enter and exit the ecosystem. So it was important for them to do a couple of things, but he highlighted three. The first was he needed, uh, and Kaiser needs uh, a, an infrastructure that is uh, you know, elastic and, and provides, uh, let's say, a time, you know, speed for the developers to create the applications. Uh, they also need uh, that same kind of uh, infrastructure, same type of platform to run on-premise, okay, within their four walls, and on, 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 on the public cloud. In particular, some of the systems of engagement type, you know, the mobile type applications. Uh, so for them, uh, you know, they wanted to have a model that worked on both. Uh, cloud Foundry does that. We provide that with the IBM Bluemix uh, platform, which can run locally, uh, public, or dedicated. Uh, so, so they went out and they implemented that. Now that was kind of thing number one, having this choice with consistency and giving speed. And by the way, they also have a really well-disciplined DevOps practice across okay. those two. Because, you know, it is non-trivial, as you know, to do, to do CI, CD in a cloud world. And, and, and you have to have a good methodology around that, right? A good, a good rigor, because you can't hide anywhere. Uh, and then when you start to add these other topologies, you even have to do more. Uh, so, so uh, you know, they, they have a really good methodology, and, and we and IBM have one which we call the Bluemix Garage Method, which we recently open sourced at, the, at, the, at a DevOps summit that was run by Gene Kim about a year ago in Santa Clara. Um, at any rate, so that was kind of step one. The second, uh, the second step was then, you know, thinking about how they can, uh, you know, fundamentally redesign and recompose their applications more quickly. And this is about not rewriting everything, okay? It is about kind of to your earlier point, accessing existing systems, right? So how do you take a, I don't know, system Z system and exposing a vSAM file through an API so, so, from a, so that it looks like a Mongo API? So if you're building a, an application, you can get access to gold, mainframe gold, through an API that you're familiar with and not have to know anything about that. So, so within our cloud, we've got uh, a lot of... Uh, uh, integration connection capability to help this kind of multi-cloud, multi uh, kind of input-output environment. So that was the second. Uh, and then the third uh, was then, you know, so once you kind of establish that and you've given developers the speed, how do you do true innovation around uh, the business process itself? Okay, and that's kind of where they're headed to next, uh, where they're starting to, you know, uh, think about, you know, how can they can offer more to their clients, how they can offer more benefit to us, as end consumers, uh, and then also how they could then take that and, and help their own uh, their own interests as well, and and that's through a process of of uh, working with end users, um, and and we call that design thinking IBM, but you know, there's different names for that, uh, and iterating on the business process. So so that's kind of the three uh, things that they spoke about. Uh, they use uh, Cloud Foundry on premise. Uh, they use it uh, on a dedicated or so a public, uh, and they're using the IBM Cloud, you know, in this case to, to deliver and the DevOps piece you know, kind of spans both sides of that equation. So how did they, you know, you're clearly intimate with their journey to sort of getting here. How did they, how did they start out, right? If that's a roadmap for what other organizations might look yeah. at as a role model, yeah. you know, do they start out with infrastructure as a service internally and try building an open stack? Uh, I'm sure we can all remember those as hard. Were they using public clouds? Was this an organizational, you know, how did that kind of shake out there? Yeah, so, okay, so three things. Let's go back to the, because it started with your second question, yeah, which was, it was, around, it was, it was around workloads. Yeah. So, so they had to identify, because everybody asks that, you know, there's a couple questions that people always ask on their cloud journeys. All right, where do I start? Do I, uh, you know, what kind of workloads do I rewrite? You know, I blow up and just rewrite. What kind of workloads do I integrate to? Uh, how do I start fresh? All right. Uh, so for them, uh, they took very much a hybrid approach. Okay, so they try to identify workloads or applications that were, say, more system engagement in nature. So those are kind of more greenfield as you're creating newer versions of business process, but with the understanding that, look, you're going to have to connect to and transact with other things. So that's kind of where they started. Uh, and, and that boils down to a very simple matrix. It's, it's funny, people overcomplicate it, but you, know, you look at in one dimension of this matrix how hard, how hard it is, that the, the, the problem that you're trying to implement. And then, you know, that's one dimension, so it's harder, let's say, on the right-hand side. And then as you move up, uh, you know, what is the actual business impact of that. So you try to choose something that's easy <laughs> to do and that has a lot of impact, right? Uh, so those are the, how they, they selected the process, uh, their, their, uh, uh, their projects to start with. Now, on the cultural aspect, 
Uh, that goes right at the heart of a couple of things. First of all, you know, uh, we've always talked about this notion of subscription, subscription-based services, right? You know, this whole, there's a whole, and, and I think that the good news is that I think a lot of the line of business application owners, uh, you know, and all the industry are getting their heads around that notion. So it is becoming much more common to do that. But culturally, when you look at the development teams, they need to change too. They need to change the how, the how you build code. Not just, you know, breaking up into squads and doing pair programming, but how do you do social coding? How do you deal with when you have aspects of your code that are open source and, 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 and proprietary? How do you deal with upstream commitments? How do you do uh, social coding? How do you do uh, true CI, CD? So there was a lot of effort put into that, uh, starting to kind of establish that culture change uh, as well. In terms of where they started, uh, they started with, uh, with the, uh, I would say, the platform layer on down. From us. Okay. So that's uh, uh, Bluemix, OpenStack, right? Uh, kind of layer. That's where they started. Okay. Uh, folks start in different places uh, in their journey. You know, I, I think uh, I think Cloud 1.0 really was about compute storage and network. You know, and it continues to be really important, important to us, important to a lot of our businesses. But I think what's happening when you look at Bluemix, you know, we're getting about 20,000 new developers signing up a week. Which you know, I look at the operations panel. That's that's a lot. Um, you know, pe uh, developers are starting to realize that, that, uh, that, you know, entering at the platform layer and, and kind of not worrying as much about the infrastructure is a good place to start, too. So out of those 20,000, you know, sort of sign-ups, what's, what's kind of the profile? Are those mostly enterprise developers who are, who are doing this? Do you have a startup contingent that's sort of using this? Yeah, that's, that's a good, it's, 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 it's a healthy mix. I think, you know, we got a lot of enterprise because that's our, our base. Uh, you can, you know, you can just a lot. Because you know, uh, you know, our, our clients hear about this. They want to they want to play with it, and, and they join kind of in force. You can, it's easy to get a you know an account, a trial account. It's like literally a couple of forms. You're in. You're doing your stuff. Um, so there's a lot of that, but there's a lot of startups too, uh, and companies you know, large and small. I mean, I gave a presentation at uh, what was uh, OpenStack or DockerCon. Anyway, one of these events with Electronic Arts, right? Good IBM client. Uh, they're running a lot of their mobile. Uh, they label the Fire Monkeys label. They got some great games. Uh, they're running their their back ends using containers on bare metal, right? Because that that is the choice that they made. They they need that level of performance. They need that level of throughput across the world. You know, last thing you want to do is be driving your car and then lag out, <laughs> you know, in your game. So um, so I, I think it's a, it's a healthy mix of of startups and of companies that you probably wouldn't uh, have imagined. Very cool. Uh, and so in terms of you know IBM and Cloud Foundry. You know, when you look at Cloud Foundry, you've just mentioned it uh, as being critical to your business in a lot of areas for your cloud strategy. Uh, talk to me a little bit about what you're contributing and kind of why contributing and, and sort of being involved, especially here at the, right. the Cloud Foundry Foundation event. Yeah. So, look, I, I, I am really proud of where we are with Cloud Foundry. Um, you know, I, I remember when uh, we started this conversation about creating a foundation. Uh, I myself actually had, had a conversation with Paul Moritz, who at the time was running that, and, and other folks within VMware and others about this idea of, hey, we got a great piece of code. Maybe we should create an open governance model around it. Similar to, by the way, what we did with OpenStack. And it wasn't just us. Others were having this dialogue. Uh, from the launch of the foundation to now, uh, it, it literally has been, uh, by all measures, the fastest growing open source project. If you look at the number of of full-time committers versus things like Linux and OpenStack, which are you know, very fast. It is on par with that, but in a shorter amount of time, uh, which is unbelievable. You know, uh, there's about 20 projects right now in Cloud Foundry. IBM is actively contributing to about uh, 12 of those. Um, we are leading uh, six projects. Um, we have uh, anywhere between 20 or 30, so full-time uh, upstream code committers into Cloud Foundry. Uh, if you look at Cloud Foundry as a uh, community, because it's not just IBM, although we do quite a bit, uh, we do, uh, you know, we're up there in the top in, in lots of different statistics in terms of contributions. But, you know, at the end of the day, uh, it, it is a community. Uh, you know, there was a calculation that was made. It's close to a half a billion dollars worth of development spend by the community in Cloud Foundry, which is a lot. That's a very big number. <laughs> which is a really big number. And, uh, and, and that, is, that is really good, because what that means is that not only is there a lot of interest and a lot of people using that, but it accelerates you know, the, the kind of expansion of knowledge and usage of the platform, okay? Um, you know, and, and when you have that, it just kind of feeds on itself. 
more and more people you know, graduate from school with knowledge or, or leave a, a job with knowledge around and, and then and they bring it to another job, right? And then they kind of continue and continue to build and grow and grow knowledge around that. Um, you know, we, uh, when we started, when we helped stand up the foundation, there was about, I think, six of us who were uh, founding members, the better, yeah, six or so, maybe eight, uh, were founding members. Um, when we set up the foundation, you know, we put a really good open governance model in place and, uh, and a meritocracy. So, you know, on day one, IBM had zero committers. You know, we had to earn our rights like everybody else, right, through contribution, through, right. through the technical talent that, that we have, uh, have there. Uh, you know, our implementation, so, so uh, I, like to, I like to say is that we're not open source leeches. <laughs> you know, we, we like to give back. And, uh, and we have, uh, as far as I know, probably the world's largest deployment of Cloud Foundry because it's, uh, it has uh, so many users uh, and, and it's on so many different countries. Wow. Right? Yeah. That's a pretty powerful statement. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a fun ride. And so when you look at, uh, you know, you, you've been party to see a lot of these trends, right? Um, you know, you've seen OpenStack from sort of day zero. Um, it was an interesting ride. Uh, you've seen Docker. You're sort of seeing a lot of the cloud native. Mm -hmm. What makes Cloud Foundry seem different to you than some of those, right? There's, there's almost a very different, uh, I want to call it more enterprise, like this is a very, it feels like a very different conference than some of those. It feels like a very different community. Sort of, do you see that? Yeah, it's interesting to say, well, you know, so I, yeah, you're right. There are some differences and I think there's a lot of similarities. I mean, I at, uh, at OSCON last year stood up with, my, with Craig from Google and Jim Zemlin and announced the CNCF because you know, I helped create that as well for, for what we're doing around containers and microservices. You know, first of all, you know, I, I, I do believe that as an industry and certainly at IBM, we're building an open cloud architecture. So, for example, for us, Compute Storage and Network, OpenStack. We use those capabilities and, and we put Cloud Foundry and what we're doing around containers and event-driven architectures on top of that, right? So there is a lot of synergy between these different efforts because they plug in nicely. In fact, I know because we implement it that way. Uh, and the communities are also working hard to reuse things. So, for example, there's no reason to create your own networking substrate, say in Cloud Foundry, reuse something, say, that OpenStack is doing, for example, or use Run C from containers inside of Cloud Foundry, right. for example, right? <clears throat> so there's lots of that going on, and there'll be more of that. So those are the, the I think, things synergize very well and complement each other well. Now, to your point around Vibe, right, in the conference, that, that's a really, it's a good observation. You know, one thing that, you know, and every time we do this, uh, whether it was back when we helped start Apache or the Linux and what we did with Eclipse, you know, I was around, I was a little, little younger, but I was around in those days, yep. right, working on that. You always learn something. Right, and and I think you know one thing that we've gotten right, a couple of things we've gotten right uh, in Cloud Foundry, and, and that's a lot of credit to Sam and the team and the foundation, is the notion of certification and interoperability day one, which is really important for enterprises. Right? Okay, enterprises want this kind of capability, but they also they they, they need to run. They don't want to get locked in. They want to be able to, to to tier or whatever their applications. So this notion of certification. Uh, and, and having that well understood or, or doing that early on, I think was, was a really good, good move and, and has given this much more of an enterprise vibe than, than, than you would probably expect. I think that, that goes a long way and that's a lesson that, that we're gonna do. The other that I think is really innovative when we saw the foundation was this notion of fast pathing people into the community. Um, you know, oftentimes when you, when you want to become a committer, it takes time, right? right. It takes time to be a committer. Well, we've got, the foundation's got six dojos, six physical locations where you can go and literally in a couple of weeks become a committer if, if, if you kind of, you know, make it through, right? And, and that is just, you know, that's kind of, I think, the new style of open source. It's a combination of, you know, apart and together right. physically because it's so much easier to learn when you're sitting next to someone every day, right? Absolutely. So those, I think, are two things that really make it. So, so as developers looking to be sort of engaged with Bluemix and start to put this stuff to work, like, how do you start? Where do you... Yeah, go okay, ahead. good question. Um, so, Bluemix.net, go in, uh, create an account, and you're in. Now, what does that mean, you're in? Well, you know, there's different ways to, once, once you have your account, you can just say, look, let's say you want to build an application. You can say, I want to build a mobile app that, that uses NoSQL, that uses Swift. You press a button and it creates your entire environment for you. It creates all the stub code with all the authentication stuff that you need, right? You can bring your code down. 
You can edit it. You could use our tooling, edit it in the cloud if you like. You could do CF push and push it all back up, and you can go deploy, right? Uh, that's uh, one way of getting started very, very quickly. And you, know, you could imagine, you don't have to worry about the infrastructure that gets handled. There's ways for you to kind of give certain SLAs and things around stuff. But at the very simple, at the simplistic point of view, you know, a notion, it is very easy to get started building applications. Uh, you could also start building containers the very same way. Uh, as well as uh, what you're doing with uh, OpenWhisk, uh, you know, for our venture-driven architectures and everything else. Uh, so that's how one gets started. Um, then what happens uh, typically is that you know you want to do more. You want to get a group of people to work on something. You want to perhaps segment a part of this, a part of the environment, and, and give different you know uh, uh, different security access roles, etc. We have the ability of doing that. You want to. Maybe you like our tool chain, you want to use it, that's great, but maybe you want to insert other things into our open tool chain. You can go do that as well, right? And, that's, and that starts to help with the enterprise use cases that you were talking, like the Kaiser, right? right? Where you have multiple speed IT, different sets of tools, and they need to plug into an overall uh, uh, delivery chain. Cool, so it sounds like it's pretty easy. So in terms of developers and sort of enterprises, what do you think their challenges are now, right? I mean, so we've got these tools, we've got lots of ways to make things easy. Where do you still see challenges for them? Yeah, you know, I think, uh, so, it, you know, it's interesting, you know, we're still at the early days of cloud. You know, it's, it's, you know, for you and I who are immersed in this, you know, we kind of take a lot of things for granted. At least I do. <laughs> you know, you go have a conversation with somebody. Um, so there is still uh, folks who are just trying to get their heads around where do they start the journey. So, for example, uh, if they're a VM farm, right, VM where from, what do they do? Well, and we got a partnership with VMware, we can take their stuff and move it on our bare metal for them. That's a beginning journey. Then expose applications as APIs into a cloud native type platform with what we've got with Bluemix, for example. Um, you know, uh, so, so there's the kind of how do I get started. The, uh, the, other, the other kind of, uh, kind of roadblock that, that folks kind of get into is, is uh, you know, what are the workloads and applications and the how I do it? Because they understand that they have to do it. The organizationally, folks kind of get it, right? Uh, but then, you know, to your point earlier, how do I identify the right workload? How do I get a project? How do I start that up? Uh, and then, and then, how do I scale it? Now, by scale, I just don't mean scale and performance and availability in the traditional sense. I also mean scale and the number of developers, number of geographies, number of people, number of humans that are involved in this process. Uh, so, I think those are areas where clients are asking lots of good questions. And, uh, and the methodologies and the things that we've got like in the Bluemix garages and so forth helps, helps, helps folks do that. Very cool. And so, uh, you know, what do you see coming next? If we fast forward a year to Cloud yes. Foundry Summit next year, what do you see as predictions? What do you think it's gonna look like? Yeah, it's funny, I, I, I said on stage that, you know, if, 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 if as a community we do two things. One, we, uh, we continue to make it as easy as possible for folks to engage with the Cloud Foundry community in terms of whether you're building an application or whether you're building a build pack or whether you're contributing code. And two, the existing members kind of just lend a hand, helping hand. We will, th this, this will triple in size in terms of number of people. I mean, there's close to 2,000 people here at this conference, right? The foundation's been up for a little over a year, right? Uh, so I, 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 can, I can see that because there's so much good energy about but when you talk about, you know, I, I talked about Cloud 1.0, the right. compute storage, and, and then now, now we're in the platform era. A lot more to do. What is starting to happen now is something that I think of as uh, industry clouds. Okay, so think about the Maslow hierarchy of needs. You got your infrastructure platform, runtimes, APIs to IoT data, Twitter data analytics, Spark, this. Okay, great. Then what? All right, then what? Well, more semantically rich things that you can reuse. So, so what we're trying to do, certainly in IBM, and our clients are asking for is provide within each industry, whether it's healthcare, right, uh, banking, retail, oil and gas, whatever, right, more semantically rich services, et cetera, that developers can use to build better applications. Reduce the concept count of what they need to do, get quicker time to value. Uh, I, I think, you know. Do you have a good be, example of one of those? Just so we can mentally wrap our heads around it? Yeah, sure. So for example, uh, in cognitive, just take what we do around Watson, right? Let's just take what we do in the, in, in, uh, in the medicine business, right? We have the ability for you know, certain areas of medicine to advise doctors, right? They're gonna do a diagnosis on you, uh, okay? 
you know, they, they think that you have A, B, and C, but they could also look at Watson and says, look, that's great. Also consider these other things. Because by looking at the, the corpus of information, it could be any of these. Now, maybe the doctor considered them all. Great. Maybe they didn't. And they can just think about it. Well, yeah. I would love Watson to be helping my doctor. That sounds great. Yeah. Uh, and are you having a lot of, uh, I mean, so these are early on, but, you know, where are a couple of successes? You know, who's doing this? You know, are you, are you do you have play, people playing with this already? Uh, you mean uh, the IBM Cloud? Yeah. Well, no, no. Well, the IBM Cloud, yes. But uh, also specifically some of these cognitive. Oh, oh yeah, yes. sure. Yeah, yeah. So we've, uh, you know, we've had a lot of successes in healthcare and in insurance and uh, in retail. Um, you know, it's, it's great. You know, we, uh, at IBM, we, uh, we're very selective about the press releases we do. And, and whenever we do one, we try to do something around a client, right, a, a, that we're working with. So there's recently been a bunch of really cool stuff that we've been doing with folks around healthcare. I guess I've been, I've been on, on that bent lately. Uh, so I think there's a huge amount of success there. You know, the uh, cognitive capability itself is a, you know, kind of also another Maslow heart of needs within itself. There's the basic, you know, speech to text, those type of right. things, right? Then you get into analysis of sentiment and whatever it's even, and then you get into actual semantic understanding of a corpus of data, right? So you kind of move up this ladder of, of sophistication, let's see, right? So a lot of our clients are quickly at the top because, you know, we work with them, and a lot of thought developers are starting kind of, you know, with the simple things, right? Uh, we even apply a cognitive to API, I, I call it API dating or API matching. So let's say you're a developer. Oh, really? Yeah, so let's say you're a developer and you, gotta, you, go, you wanna use a version of React or Angular or something, right? But you don't know which version to use or of an API or something, right? You, you, so you go, you, stack, you search around for hours to try to find the right thing, right? right? Well, we actually have done a lot of those searches and we can advise you, say, hey, you know, for what you're trying to do, this is what most people are doing Go do it, right? Go give, give, give it a try. Give, give it, you know, here's things you can go give it a try to get help. So that's that's even improving the experience of the development process itself. It's just this is really cool. That's awesome. Well, cool. Um, thank you very much for coming today. We thank appreciated you. having a chance to chat with you. Thank Sounds you everyone like for listening. Some awesome stuff's going on. All right, take care. Thank you. Bye bye. The Cloud Foundry Foundation is our sponsor here for our podcast from the Cloud Foundry Summit in Santa Clara, California. Our discussion. The path emerging as organizations move beyond the confusion of disruption and take the journey to transformation. We'll explore the new concepts of multi-cloud and how it relates to open source app development and management at scale. Cloud Foundry gives companies the speed, simplicity, and control they need to develop and deploy applications faster and easier. Learn more about Cloud Foundry at cloudfoundry.org.